Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first Q&A with Pekka, Marco, and Nishant. This session will run for 30 minutes. As a reminder, we will have a second Q&A session later today, following the business group presentations. If you have any questions that are clearly business group specific, I would like to ask you to consider saving those for the second Q&A session. Two more things from me. First, please limit yourself to one question only as a courtesy to everyone else in the queue. Second, please remember to unmute your microphone and turn on your video after we place you into the live call. So without further ado, let's start the Q&A session. Please raise your hand if you would like to ask a question. And again, once you are brought into the live call, please remember that you will need to unmute your microphone and turn on your video. We'll take our first question from Sandeep Deshpande from JP Morgan. Hi, uh, thanks for letting me on. Uh, Pekka, I have a question uh, in terms of uh, how you see the nearer term compared to 23. I mean, you are dealing with in the short term share loss at some of your major customers. And so will we see that uh, progression towards revenue growth in 22? Or is this still going to be weighing down on your sales and that really beyond uh, 22 is when we will see that uh, growth be, uh, beyond the market growth? Thank you, Sandeep. And of course, we are not providing detailed guidance for 22. So I will, I will uh, basically comment 23 when, when I, as, I, as we said, that uh, our target is then to grow faster than the market. But I still want to give you a little bit more context. Of course, this will be in a way a year of reset. And I'm very encouraged with what I'm, what I'm seeing both on the technology side. And you will hear from Tommy, Tommy about the progress on his uh, 5G turnaround roadmap. But perhaps even more importantly, uh, the recent deal flow that we have we have had you will have seen the T-Mobile deal in early early this year. Then then uh, uh, CNS led uh, deals with all, all major uh, web scales. Uh, we have increased market share in IP routing now later in optical networks also in Europe. And then on top of everything, the very important uh, uh, five year five uh, G uh, C band deal with uh, AT and T uh, today. So this means that I'm growingly encouraged by uh, our situation and and i certainly hope that this in a way hit that we took this year because of the earlier decisions by some of the customers that this will truly be a re year of reset and then we will start to see uh, improvement um, already next year and not have to wait uh, wait until 23. thank you very much thank you sandeep for our next question let's go to dom Olszewski from Morgan Stanley. Yes. Afternoon, everyone. Thanks for taking the question and for the presentation. On mobile networks, previously, you've obviously talked about the reef shark deployments, which are expecting to, to reach 100% of shipments by 2022. And that was to drive lower product costs and improve your margins. And obviously, you're guiding to 5 to 8% by 2023, while your main peer is in the mid to high teens. So could you bridge us to explain what the Delta is and what the what has to improve in order for you to hit that range? Uh, first of all, you have to look at the, the trajectory between this year and then uh, uh, 2023 in mobile networks, and it is quite a significant improvement. And uh, of course, we have not said that what we expect to achieve in 23 would be the ultimate uh, target, but we have to be realistic as to how quick the improvement uh, can uh, be. And as, as I was describing in my presentation, we do believe that the peak of the 5G market will continue quite uh, a long time, and it will be driven by by the digital enterprise uh, opportunity and 70% and of world's enterprises investing in 5G uh, and so on. So all that makes me uh, pretty uh, optimistic about our 5G situation. And when you compare us to uh, the competitor that you referred to, it's always important to keep in mind that there are some reporting structure uh, differences. They are reporting some of their uh, IP licensing uh, business together with the uh, networks uh, business. If we were to 
report in the same way, uh, our mobile network's profitability would be significantly better already today compared to what we are reporting. Can I just uh, build on what Pekka said? Um, uh, I think that if you listen to Tommy's presentation today, uh, you will hear some more ambitions from Tommy as well, and, and uh, you will uh, get some more flavor on this as well. I think that Tommy will give a little bit more ambitions beyond 23 as well. Just a cliffhanger here. Very good. Thank you, Dom. Let's take our next question from Alex Peturk at SG. Yes, yes, hi, thank you. Thanks for taking my, my question. Um, I'd just like to understand um, regarding the restructuring um, impact on your PL. Um, are you going to uh, actually uh, reduce your OPEX at all, or is it going to be uh, br broadly flat or perhaps even rising as you uh, seek to reinvest into, into R&D and at the same time you have also uh, OPEX inflation? So is basically all of the operating margin uh, improvement going to stem from improved gross margins and economies of scale? Thanks a lot. Yes, thank you. As we as we said uh, uh, two days uh, uh, ago, uh, what we are really doing is that we are in a way making room uh, with the cost reset. We are taking advantage of the new simplified uh, operational model and this way creating room for additional R&D investment uh, because it is so important to be able to invest more, not only in mobile networks, but also in some other parts uh, of the businesses. So in relative terms in our, our OPEX, in our personnel, the relative share of R&D of the total OPEX will uh, increase. So this is kind of the high level picture, but then Marco, if you want to give a little bit more color on how the numbers will look like. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, as we are now guiding, we are uh, saving about 600 million uh, during uh, 2021 to 23. And uh, at the same time, we are increasing our investments in R&D, like Pekka mentioned, and also capability uh, uh, shift. And, and uh, also we have the inflation. So we have uh, areas which, which uh, are increasing costs. Uh, but we are uh, being able, with this cost-saving program, uh, to invest in these areas. But if you look beyond 2023, when we have received all of these savings, then actually the cost base is uh, all other items equal, actually lower 600 million than it would have been if we wouldn't have done this cost-saving program. Thank you, Alex, for your question. For our next question, let's move to uh, Daniel Durberg from Handelsbanken. Daniel, whenever you're ready, please go ahead. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, unfortunately, my, my video seems not to work, but I hopefully you can hear me. Yes. Yes, yes. that's great. Uh, I was wondering uh, if you can comment a little bit on the uh, uh, on the mobile network gross margin outlook for 21, 22, and possibly also 23 uh, in terms of, uh, of improvement and the impact on pricing issues this year. Thank you. You will actually hear in Tommy's presentation uh, information and uh, assumptions around uh, the different uh, parts of the, uh, of the p and uh, development and uh, of course, our general ambition level when the product competitiveness increases is that that uh, would then be reflected in the gross margin uh, as well. But what we have decided quite clearly is that we, we do not guide separately on uh, gross margin. Uh, we are just commenting the uh, operating margin, which is then, of course, the product of gross margin and, uh, and OPEX. Yeah, that's fair enough. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Daniel. I appreciate your question. Let's take our next question from Richard Kramer at Adete. So, Pekka, you're now on Nokia restructuring maybe 3.0 or 4.0 since the Alcatel merger. And I guess when we look at the past plans, however well-intentioned that they were, they didn't deliver sustainable cost cuts or higher profits. So, and, and oftentimes they destabilized the organization such that you had to make catch-up investments in, in R&D. I guess my question is, what is materially different this time? 
And specifically, when you talk about accountability for the business units, and equally, you mentioned all your enthusiasm for private networks, how are you going to en- address an area like enterprise, which cuts across business units? No one seems to have specific responsibility for that. And yet, it seems to be a big part of your future growth. Thanks very much. Thank you. Of course, I do not have all the details about the previous restructurings. I have been here only only a few months, but uh, but what is really, really important this time now is that uh, this is not only cost cutting, this is much more strategic. First of all, we are changing or have changed our operational model, significant simplification, removing many of the matrix complexities that we that we have management team from 17 to 11. We had a, a management team structure where it was pretty unclear in some cases that who should make each decision. Now it is crystal uh, clear. The BGs have a full accountability. So we are, we are simplifying the operational model and that is structurally enabling us to take out cost from certain parts uh, of the organization. And we are reinvesting a lot of that money then in R&D, because the important thing here to understand is that when you look at our performance over the past few years, we have had good pockets of performance and bad pockets. And, and overall, I guess, on aggregate, we cannot be happy with how things have gone. And, and there is a very direct connection between product competitiveness and the gross margin for that product and then overall profitability of that particular particular unit. And that's why it is extremely important that in those cases where we still have subscale performance, that we find a way of becoming either number one or number two in technology. That is the only way to drive gross margin. That is the only way to drive drive profit. And that's why we are now doing this structural change through the operational model where we are taking out costs from somewhere else and putting it into, uh, into um, uh, R&D. This is really the biggest difference as I see it compared to the uh, previous uh, models that we have uh, had. Thank you, Richard. Then, so, oh, then, then sorry, sorry, Matt, hey, sorry, sorry, I forgot, hey, Matt, sorry, I forgot to answer the second part of the question, which was the enterprise, because, uh, of course, uh, we are pretty bullish about the potential of uh, of uh, the connected digital enterprise, where, of course, private wireless is one, one part, and um, uh, yes, our business structure is solution-based, uh, so we are not structuring the business groups around the customer groups. They are structured around technologies and solutions, and all of them will be selling to different customer groups. But what we have done is that we have created one uh, integrated uh, sales force for enterprise customers that is pulling together the solutions from the three uh, BGs. This sales force is organized under the cloud and network services uh, business it is one sales force going after the enterprise customers, uh, adjusting to the clock speed that the enterprise customers need, which is often a different clock speed from CSPs. And then financially, the end result will be reported in the three BGs, depending on which part of the solution we are, uh, we are selling. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. Thank you, Richard. For our next question, let's go to the line of Peter Kurt Nielsen from ABG. Thank you very much, Matt. I seem to have some issues with my my video. Uh, Thank you for the presentations and for the opportunity. I'd like to return to the issue of return on capital employed, please. Uh, The more than 7% um, target uh, over time does not seem overly ambitious. Can that be reached through the 2023 targets, which you have outlined? And, and perhaps could you elaborate on longer term ambitions for that and, and the impact of um, and, and a scale uh, on this and, and where that would leave you sort of going forward? Any, any elaborations on this uh, would be much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, we we have actually guided today also uh, comparable uh, return on capital employed at the group level. So for 2021, we've said between 10 to 15 percent, and for 2023, we've said between 15 and 20 percent. And and uh, the seven percent is only a cost of capital that the group has today. And um, and of course, each of businesses we will assess what is the maximum. Uh, opportunity we see there and set the targets based on their 
circumstances and opportunities as well. So we definitely uh, are driving uh, higher uh, returns than, than the cost of capital. And, and, um, uh, and this is not another uh, maximum ambition level that we have. Okay, may I ask a follow-up relation to the uh, to the outlook? At, at the strategy update in December, you provided some indicative margin guidance for the business areas um, for 21 and also longer term. I, I guess that 23 does not qualify as longer term. So are we to understand it that you do see further upside to long-term uh, margins um, beyond 2023? Thank you. Yeah, now, now we are focused on guiding for 2020. Uh, one and two and three, and uh, if you listen to each of the beaches presentations today, I think that you will get some more flavor on as well where we are. And and as we've said many times, the technology uh, investments are extremely critical here, and we believe that we have a very good foundation to be a leader in these areas. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter Kurt. I believe the next question will come from the line of Artem Beletsky from SCB. Artem, if you're there, please go ahead. Artem, can you hear me? Uh, yes, Perfect. yes, I please can. Please go ahead, Artem. Uh, I would like to ask further on uh, stepping up borrowing the investments. Could we, could we maybe talk about uh, key areas uh, where you will be increasing uh, investments going forward and maybe uh, continue on the same topic, what comes to mobile networks, do, do you still expect that uh, this year will be basically a, a peak in terms of R&D spend? Yes, thank you. I will ask um, Nishant to, to get into a bit more, uh, meet more details. But of course, when we talk about the R&D investment, the biggest increase is really, really in Tommy's uh, uh, 5G um, R&D. Um, and then, of course, yes, I understand the question that that uh, when will it peak? Uh, when it comes to the FPGA uh, R&D, which is one part of it, I mean that uh, will uh, will come to uh, an end development-wise uh, when we complete the SOC program. And as you know, the target is 100% uh, deliveries uh, based on SOCs by the end of uh, uh, next year. And that means that then the FPGA part of the development can be can be uh, ramped down with the exception of uh, some uh, uh, maintenance. Then the overall R&D, uh, we are not currently guiding separately because it will then move on, on how, it will depend on how much opportunities we will, we will see in uh, other uh, businesses and uh, what other segments uh, we are going to invest in, in mobile networks. That's why we are only guiding uh, the operating margin and the expected R&D investment is now embedded in the 2023 guidance. But uh, Nishant, why don't you comment a little bit the most uh, potential R&D investment areas going forward? Yeah, thanks, Becca. And here it's about having a very targeted approach. Uh, within mobile networks, of course, the focus here has been to invest uh, on the silicon side of things for system on chip. There's also been a focus to invest on uh, critical areas like L1 and uh, you know linearization software for radio. Uh, very important for uh, not just catch up but leapfrog. Uh, within uh, cloud and network services, it's really around the strategy of uh, digital orchestration, security, and automation. And uh, for NI, uh, here it's about data center switching. It's about also orchestration and automation and control platforms. And uh, finally, for uh, our long-term investments that we do within uh, Yenis uh, BG on technologies, it's about device-centric investments. You will see two big trends, uh, software increasingly uh, becoming important across the BGs. And I would also highlight that we've started investing on early research on 5G evolution towards 6G. Thank you, Artem. Yeah, very thank you. Yeah, thank you, Artem. Let's take our next question from Simon Leopold at Raymond James. Thanks for taking the question. I understand and appreciate the, the pivot in, in operating expenses in favor of R&D, but what I'm really seeking is maybe a clear understanding of what are the sacrifices Nokia will make? In other words, what is it you would have done that you're no longer going to do in these efforts to restructure and become leaner? Thank you. Well, when we are removing the matrix structures and simplifying simplifying the organization that uh, makes it possible to uh, rationalize uh, 
layers of the organization uh, simplifying uh, and uh, and uh, uh, increasing cost efficiency uh, of uh, support functions, administration, um, and so on. Uh, R&D is something that we are uh, protecting. We are uh, increasing it. The customer interface, the key salespeople are also, of course, in an extremely important and crucial role. But I would say that everything else, everybody else, every, everything in the organization, not R&D, not taking care of the customer interface, we have identified a lot of opportunities to, to uh, improve uh, cost uh, uh, efficiency. And then of also, as you will hear in the uh, VG presentations, uh, even though we are saying that uh, we are increasing R&D investment to go for technology leadership, there is opportunities to rationalize the product portfolio and, uh, and uh, reduce R&D in uh, products uh, which are getting closer to the end of its uh, life cycle. So the R&D investment, even though we are talking so much about that, that does not mean that there would not be possibilities to optimize, rationalize and, and, and scrutinize uh, that uh, either. But the general name of the game is that, uh, that uh, we are uh, taking cost out from ev everything else but uh, the customer interface and R&D and then uh, investing it in mostly R&D. I believe that we and we have evidence of that, that the customer interface, the sales organization, the account teams that we have, that's a really, really high quality organization. I do not see that being a bottleneck. On the R&D side, yes, there have been bottlenecks and this is how we are creating funding for that. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, now let's try to take Stefan Slowinski's question once more. Um, uh, first of all, thank you to Pekka and, and Marco and Nishan for the presentations. And just a, a question for uh, Marco around cash flow um, and the profile of the cash outflow for this newest uh, round of restructuring. Um, you still have the 500 million left over from previous rounds. Um, will the cash outflow for the current new restructuring, will that match the, the P&L charges? I'm not sure if you've provided that yet. Um, and uh, along the same lines in terms of cash flow from now to 2023, do you expect any changes in the technologies group um, and the cash conversion there um, from, from EBIT to free cash flow and, and how that could impact cash flow over the coming couple of years? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Uh, what comes to the uh, restructuring, as you mentioned, we have the 500 million and about half of that will be uh, in, in this year's uh, cash outflow. The new program, we have guided that uh, about the same amount uh, would be impacted this year's cash flow. Uh, and then what comes to later pro later years, we haven't actually guided yet because we have to see also with the, those countries where we have uh, Brooks Council negotiations, how those negotiations are going and, and what is the, p the pace of those. And, and then we will give you more guidance when we know that. What comes to the technology and, and, and cash flow uh, versus EBIT, um, difference. As we've guided now for this year, it's about 600 million difference. Um, going forward, it depends totally on what are the deals we are signing and what is the cash flow um, timing issue in those deals. Uh, some deals could be so that, that we get some prepayments, uh, but then we might have deals that we don't get any prepayments. It will follow the the OPS, operating profit as well. So it's very difficult to predict yet. But here as well, I promise we will give you guidance uh, when we have more visibility on this issue. Thank you, Stefan. Great. Thank you. Thank you. For our next question, let's go to Amit Harchandani at City. Hello, everyone. This is Amit Harchandani from City, and thanks for letting me ask a question. Uh, I would like to go back to the topic of gross margins, please. Um, I must admit, uh, I'm still not clear why you would not like to guide specifically on gross margins, given it's such a key metric that investors look at. But at least qualitatively, could you give us a sense for what are the key, the most critical drivers that would drive the uplift in gross margins? Is it lower cost of product, exit from lower margin contracts, any other avenues? So anything you can share with us to help build a trajectory for gross margins over the next three years would be helpful. Thank you. 
Thank you. That's a, that's an excellent uh, excellent question, and uh, of course, uh, uh, I mean, in the big picture, why are we investing in technology leadership and uh, in uh, uh, number one or two technology position in uh, those segments where we have decided to compete? The fundamental reason for that is to drive gross margin up because the technology uh, position, first of all, it gives you pricing power. Uh, in the deals uh, that you are making, so you get higher prices. But then very importantly, as you will see, for example, in Tommy's presentation later, uh, when we are proceeding in R&D, that is lowering uh, the uh, cost of goods uh, sold, the cost uh, of, the, uh, of the product. Uh, and then, yes, especially in uh, uh, Ragaf's uh, business, uh, in the new structure, there is still some uh, old uh, lower gross margin uh, contracts uh, in the services uh, business that we are uh, rationalizing at the moment. So actually, this is an excellent question. It's all of those together. We have decided to guide on top line and then uh, operating margin for the for the businesses, but we have decided not to not to provide more granularity than this. And I do not believe that this is that untypical on the uh, on the market. But the ambition. I promise it's very clear that through the technology investment, our ambition is to drive gross margins up. Thank you, Amit. And for our final question for this session, we'll go to the line of Andrew Gardner from Barclays. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for taking the question. Uh, I had another one sort of on a related topic in terms of R&D and, and leading to that gross margin competitiveness that you were just talking about, Pekka. Um, you, know, you guys have talked about returning to industry leadership um, in technology, uh, but I'm just wondering about your relative levels of competitiveness within R&D. Uh, you haven't been specific uh, in terms of, sort of the R&D levels as we look out a few years, but it feels like you're still going to be about a third below uh, where Ericsson would be on a comparable basis. Um, who knows exactly what is going to happen with Huawei, but they clearly are investing more as well. So what is it um, about sort of the current plan that is giving you the confidence in indeed getting to a number one, number two position uh, in terms of technology with uh, a much leaner R&D budget? Thank you. I will ask Nishan to, Nishan to comment this, but before he does, I will I will uh, comment on a general level, and then of course the business groups will uh, will zoom into this in their uh, particular uh, parts. But uh, this has a very important connection to the operational model now, and this is to some extent different from the from the past. That when we say that ABG is fully accountable for the business. One of the key reasons why we made this change was that we wanted to create a direct connection accountability-wise between the significant R&D investment, 4.1 billion euros last year, and what we produce with that all the way to the customer interface. In the previous operational model, this accountability was not clear because it came to the leadership team and ultimately to me through two different uh, dimensions uh, in the organization. Now the responsibility is in the same hands. Whoever is responsible for the R&D investment and has the R&D budget is also responsible for the uh, success of the products in the customer interface. And as I said earlier, uh, if we have products uh, or segments where we do not see a path to leadership, uh, then we will assess our options. Nishant. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's first, you know, without commenting on competition, I, I'm not sure if that's a, a, that's a sort of the difference in R&D intensity on the group level. But if we specifically look at that, there, uh, I can speak from experience. The biggest bang for the buck is when you know what you're going to build. Target active portfolio management gets you the best returns. And that is a big focus for us as a management team. The second piece is actually R&D intensity. So you're investing enough. And then we find the, the right nuggets. We feel that there is adequate investment behind. We're solving the bottlenecks. I talked about some of them. We're solving for where we really needed extra hands and feet behind them. Finally, it's about R&D productivity. And that has many facets to it. It's about digitalization of processes and tools. In aggregation, I would say, we as a management feel rather confident between the right portfolio choices 
sufficient R&D investments and intensity in the right targeted areas and the right R&D productivity curve, which we have seen over the last two years, especially in ML. We feel that there is enough muscle to take the one or two spots that Pekka talked about in each of the businesses. Thank you, Andrew, for your question. And thank you again to everyone for all of your questions uh, for this session.